Greetings and welcome to this module on open source software. All semester long I've been talking about open source. I've been telling you that this is a class about open source software development principles. We've been using software, it turns out, that is open source. All of the packages, Eclipse is open source. Um, Finebugs, CheckStyle, PMD, Maven, they're all open source. What's the deal with that anyway, you might be wondering. At least, I hope you're wondering. Um, this module is a very quick introduction to why it is that I think open source software is so important and why any professional software developer should really be um, aware of the impact that this, this approach to software development has had on the community, why it's so important, why you want to participate. So we're going to briefly dash through some of the many aspects of open source software in, in the next few minutes. Let's start with a little history. The cool thing about software is it used to be free. Way back in the beginning, it turned out that companies viewed the hardware as the thing that you sold to customers, and the software you just gave to them. It was just the maraschino cherry on top of, of the hardware. And so it was no big deal. This was you know back in the 60s and so forth. But it turned out that by the 70s, people started to realize, whoa, you know, we're spending a lot of effort on this software. And in fact, the software gives our hardware a competitive advantage over somebody else's hardware. And so software uh, uh, suddenly became viewed as a form of intellectual property. And so in order to protect it, people came up with licenses, the idea that you would uh, not disclose it if you uh, worked for the company, that you could even have patents. Very controversial. I could have a whole other module about about patents and whether or not they should or should not apply to software. Um, but anyway, there's all these different mechanisms that people created to try to protect uh, software as a form of intellectual property. Okay. Now that wasn't the only kind of movement with respect to software. Um, there were people on the West Coast that were developing a, an operating system called Unix um, and they uh, wanted a way to kind of encourage development, so they distributed it um, with a license that said uh, you already had to have the Unix um, license, but you know the BSD license was going to, or the BSD product was going to have some additional license associated with it. On the East Coast, we had um, a, a person named Richard Stallman. He was in the MIT. AI lab, as I recall, he was having problems getting um, the source code for uh, some kind of driver, I think, for for um, for a list machine or uh, a Unix machine, maybe. Um, anyway, he got very irritated that he couldn't obtain the source for this driver, and it kind of led him down a path which eventually led to a whole philosophy about the appropriate role of software and the appropriate role of software developers as a way to improve society. And he published this thing called the GNU Manifesto and started this thing called the Free Software Foundation, which was supposed to organize together people who were going to develop and use this thing, this concept that he invented called free software. What is that? Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. Now, um, Back um, on the West Coast, we have folks continuing to work on BSD Unix, okay, and uh, they're developing more and more kinds of systems um, developed based upon this source code, NetBSD, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, etc. So we kind of have these two parallel streams happening on the West Coast with uh, this Unix variant, um, and on the East Coast with Richard Stallman and his Free Software Foundation. Now, then enters the mixed uh, Linus Torvalds in Finland, okay, who was interested in um, developing an operating system, a Unix-like operating system, on top of the x86, or, you know, kind of the, the Microsoft Intel um, chipset. And so what he did is he essentially took a bunch of the, the GNU project. The GNU project had a compiler, it had Emacs, it had you know, um, you know, some networking um, packages, and he combined that with his own code to complete the first um, actual working operating system um, 
or a Unix-based kernel using all open source co code, and he called this Linux. Okay, so on top of that, so now we have an open source software system, Linux. Um, we ha plus we have the West Coast folks with the Berkeley, the the BSD um, Unix variants. Then we have. Um, and of course, computers are getting networked together, and there's these various protocols, FTP and email and so forth. But then we have Tim Berners-Lee invent a protocol for making it much easier for people to present information in a more graphical format using this language called HTML and this protocol called HTTP, and he called this thing the World Wide Web. And of course, that made... Uh, that led to a kind of an explosion of information sharing. People now had these, um, you know, could develop a server which could serve up these pages according to this protocol and it made information sharing much easier. Okay, once we have the ability of people to share information dramatically more easily, okay, we have much more interest in sharing software and in kind of a, a more collaborative approach to development where people all over the place could join together and work together. Prior to that, it was somewhat harder to find people to create, you know, organize interest groups. There were, there were mailing groups and, you know, email and FTP and there, you know, there was, there was, there was a way to do it, but the advent of the World Wide Web enabled people to find each other a lot more easily than they could before. And what you see is that there's kind of two approaches to this process of um, sharing software and co-developing it in a, in a kind of a loosely collaborative way. The first group are the GNU folks led by Richard Stallman who view this as a philosophical um, I idea that what we want to do is we want to kind of ensure that your work can be utilized by others and that the investment that you make into uh, developing software and giving it to other people won't be um, kind of co-opted by commercial interests. And then the folks on the West Coast who are uh, coming out of the BSD Unix, they're not so concerned about that. They just like to get stuff out there. If other people want to commercialize it in their own ways, that's that's not a big deal. Okay. So the one of the primary kind of fundamental tenets of the open source, soft, open source software movement is this thing called the GNU Manifesto. And it states that there should be four freedoms that software should adhere to. One is that you shouldn't be restricted with respect to the way you run a program. You shouldn't be restricted um, in your ability to modify a program if you need to. Okay, so the source code should be accessible and there shouldn't be licensing that prevents you from being able to modify it. You should be able to redistribute copies of software that you or others under this approach, under this free software without any restriction. You might ask people to pay you um, for, for giving it to them, but it should be freely available. And you should be able, you shouldn't be prevented from distributing your changes to others so that other people can benefit from it. And this, this manifesto arose from the fact that MIT had created this windowing system called X Windows. And then, um, shoots, I forget which company, had, had taken this, X, this free software and then produced their own proprietary version of X Windows with these enhancements and were selling that and not providing back to the community the changes that they'd made. So people felt like, um, you know, basically this company, I can't remember which one, had kind of exploited the hard work of the original developers of the X Windows system. Okay, so the GNU manifesto and this approach to these freedoms were, were ways of guaranteeing that if you put a lot of energy into producing something like X Windows, other people can take it, other people can improve it, but they can't turn around and take those improvements and, and make it private. They have to provide those improvements back to the community. So how are they going to accomplish this goal? And the way that they're going to do it is by implementing this idea called copy left, which is kind of the inverse of copy right. Okay, with copy left, what you're saying is that you are making a program or you know source code free, and you're requiring that anybody that takes your version of it and makes any modifications to it, if they do that, they have to make those modifications free as well. So the essential idea is this is a viral kind of license. Okay, 
So the GNU, the GNU public license is a way of implementing copy left. And as I said before, you know, the, the most controversial part of this license, and it was very deliberate because it's part of this philosophical stance. The idea is that when you modify GPL software, you have to distribute your modifications under the same license. Okay, you, you can't turn around and sell um, the stuff, you know, the modifications that you've made, you can't incorporate into a more proprietary license and kind of, you know, hide it in there. So this made it, this was very controversial um, to some people because they said, geez, if I start to use any software that was licensed under the GPL and I integrate it into some other software that I've made, it kind of infects that other software and all of a sudden that other software has to be GPL as well. Now this is not a, this is a feature or a bug depending upon how you, you know, you think about it. If you're Richard Stallman, this is a feature. This is exactly what he wants to have happen because he wants to have GPL-based software grow and grow and grow and grow and eventually become the, the standard way that all software is, is produced. Okay, others, you know, in, in companies that had the more conventional IP-based view of software viewed this as a big problem, okay? And they liked the idea of sharing. They didn't like this viral nature. And so what they did is they came up with this alternative concept as opposed to free software they wanted to call it open software and the idea of open source software is to incorporate some of the, the the sharing aspects of free software without that viral nature okay so here's you know 10 clauses and um, basically the, the it adheres to many of the same concepts of as free software except for that kind of viral nature. So you can, you can have open source licenses that allow other people to take your software and incorporate it into proprietary software and not, and not damage the license associated with that others. Okay, so these are the, the, you know, Richard Stallman said, we disagree on the basic principles, but agree more or less on the practical recommendations. So we can do work together on many specific projects. We don't view the open source movement as the enemy, um, which is a good thing. You'll also hear a FLOSS, which is the free Libra open source software. And again, um, it's yet another variant on trying to, to distinguish between free with respect to um, you know, no, no licensing entangle entanglements versus free, uh, you know, no money changes hand. Okay, so for example, you know, many times if you buy an open source software, you may have to you know, give them some money for, for printing the manual or shipping the software or something out, out to you for those that still ship software. Okay, so what's examples of open source licenses as opposed to the GPL, which is the free license? Um, the MIT license is, is a, the, the most permissive popular common license. And the essential idea of the MIT license is that you can do anything you want with software distributed under the MIT license, except remove the MIT license. <laughs> okay. Um, another one is called the Apache software license. This is a very, very common license. And it has, again, most of the, um, the, the aspects of the GNU license, except for the fact that it's, it's not viral. Um, and uh, you... Uh, you know, you can take the, the software and make it, um, um, you don't necessarily have to make it available down in to, to others once you've made modifications. An alternative and more popular license is called the Creative Commons license, and this is a license which is usually not applied to source code, but applied to things like images and videos and, and um, documents. And there are these four features, attribution, share alike, non-commercial, and no derivatives. And the way, the way that you, you kind of specify the license associated with your particular document is by having one or more of these uh, parts kind of combined together. So you could have a license that's attribution only, that's a very permissive one, or you could have a license that says it's Creative Commons attribution share alike and no derivatives, which would be a more restrictive form of license. Okay, now in addition to you know, the history, in addition to the kinds of licensing which determine the way that sharing occurs, there's also a development process associated with open source software that's just as unique as the licensing. And it's, it's a very critical part, really, of, of what it means to be open source software. 
Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but I, th I want all of you to read the seminal paper about this called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. It's, it's really a classic of modern um, you know, software development process literature, um, well written and, and interesting. So that's, a, that's an assignment. Um, the impact of this, art, this, this paper when it was released was so great that the company Netscape decided to actually release their, one of the crown jewels of their IP, the Mozilla browser, under this um, free software license. So the idea is, in the Bizarre Model in Brief, you, you know, users are co-developers. They should have access to the code. They should be able to report bugs. Um, you want to release early, release often. Um, you want to have a very dynamic decision-making structure and, and other things which you can look at when you read the paper. Now, the open source development is interesting because um, it has very kind of complementary strengths and weaknesses and in a given open source project it could either succeed or fail based upon to what extent the idea that the software is free that people can work concurrently and that people can kind of scratch their own itch and make changes the way they want to um, you know that can lead to chaos or it can lead to a really rapid rate of of development and it just depends upon whether or not the community can come together and kind of manage that that freedom and the open the cathedral cathedral in the bazaar kind of talks about that and explains how you know in in the case of Linux um, you know they were able to figure out a way to actually um, you know do this do this successfully or they they showed how a, a community like Linux can do this successfully okay so um, there's this there's this idea of meritocracies in open source software development where based upon your skill with the software, your time and commitment spent in the community, you kind of rise in the project management um, hierarchy. It's not kind of purely a political uh, kind of thing. Um, so there's these graphics about how you know you start off being a visitor, then you become a novice, a regular, a, a leader, and then finally an elder um, as you kind of ascend the, the, the hierarchy. Okay, now how can you make money off of this? It turns out there's some very interesting business models um, that enable companies to actually thrive use within an open source software perspective. Um, MySQL is one of them. It's owned by Oracle. They give away the software. They sell support and maintenance, um, and they have the you know they have these statistics that says for every paying customer they estimate that they have a thousand free users okay but they actually view those free users as potential customers in fact they view their free users as potential future employees um, so you can read more about MySQL um, and, and, and learn more about it but the point being is that's a very successful um, company that's been built on this open source licensing model their um, open source, the general approach has, has kind of transcended software at this point. I provide an article in the module about Wikipedia, which is very interesting. Even um, there's an open source version of, of Coca-Cola. Okay, and then of course there's um, open source um, scientific journals, um, publication mechanisms from, by, by PLOS. Okay, so in summary, what does all of this mean for you? What I think it means for you is that as a student, you should be publishing everything you can under an open source license and getting it out there into the community as a GitHub project because this is your time to create a body of work which other people can look at and use to understand your capabilities and strengths and accomplishments as a software developer. Okay, If you are developing software, um, it's important to think about the different kinds of licenses that are out there. Do you want to go with a GPL license, which is viral? Do you want to go with an open source license like MIT, which is very permissive? Um, and you know, th those kinds of decisions are going to impact upon the community that you, you work with. Um, finally, if you're an entrepreneur and want to start a business, you should think carefully about you know, whether a proprietary license is most appropriate for your business model or whether there are open source approaches that can actually provide interesting uh, advantages. Thanks a lot.